My great-grandfather said in the letter that he did not wish his descendants to blindly seek revenge and be deceived by things of the past. I think what's most important for each person is not the past, but the present. Even though we must carry the burdens from the past, there are also things we wish to strive for, speaking for myself. I'd rather see him recognize and atone for his mistakes than see him punished for them. This is the complete story of Scaramouche. 500 years ago, six of the seven Archons were summoned to deal with the disaster in Conria, but the Electro Archon Makoto had never been much of a fighter and did not survive the fallout. As Makoto lay dying in her twin's arms, A salvaged what she could of her sister's consciousness, recovered the Electronosis, and returned to Inazuma with a heavy heart. With the assistance of the sacred Sakura tree that appeared on Narukami Island, A was able to put an end to the disaster plaguing her country, and peace once again returned to Inazuma. But A had lost so much to the disaster. Makoto, Kitsune Saigyu, Chiyo, Sasayuri, all of her friends lost to time. A was alone, terrified of what new disasters the future might bring. If only time could just stand still. Then the world could be eternal, undying, unchanging, free from the destruction of erosion and decay. By chance, she stumbled upon an ancient Conrian technique that could create humanoid mechanical puppets indistinguishable from other living forms. Mechanical beings should surely be able to resist erosion, she thought, and quickly crafted a plan to build a new Electro-Archon, a wooden puppet. One of these successful creations would eventually become Scaramouche. And although he was considered a successful creation, he had one fatal flaw in the eyes of his creator. As the new Electro Archon, he would need to house the Electronosis. But when A tried to give him the Gnosis, he began to cry in his sleep. You see, her entire life, A had been a warrior, and to say she struggled to understand and master her own emotions would be a bit of an understatement. Emotions had always been Makoto's area of expertise, after all. And it's possible that A saw these emotions as a fatal weakness that led to Makoto's death. An equally emotional puppet would certainly meet a similar fate, and A could not entrust the Gnosis or the role of Archon to such a being. So A left Scaramouche in the Shake Pavilion with a golden feather as the only proof of his origins, and then left to create a second, emotionless, autonomous puppet that would house her consciousness and allow her to meditate alone for eternity while the puppet carried out the duty of the Archon. This new puppet had no need for the Gnosis, so it was sent to Yaimiko for safekeeping. And although he was supposed to sleep forever, Scaramouche awoke inexplicably, blank as a fresh sheet of paper. He was soon discovered by a young deputy known as Katsuragi, who recognized him as being of noble birth due to the golden feather he possessed. Katsuragi was a kind man with a big heart, so he couldn't just leave a young boy alone. So he took Scaramouche back to Tatarasuna with him, but told the people there that he had found the boy wandering Nazuchi Beach instead of inside the Shake Pavilion. He claimed that this was for the boy's own protection. But even in his newborn state, Scaramouche was full of insecurities. Why was he so different from the people he found himself with? He had no need to eat, or sleep, or breathe. Was there something wrong with him? Is that why his creator had cast him aside like worthless dross? And if even his creator hadn't wanted him, then why would these humans want him? But the people of Tatarasuna didn't think of him in that way. They welcomed him with an unfamiliar kindness and taught him many things like how to read and write, and even gave him a name, the Kabukimono. But the human that mattered most to him at this time was the head of the Mikage Furnace, a bladesmith by the name of Niwa Hisahide. In many respects, Niwa was Scaramouche's first taste of family. He was aware that Scaramouche was a mechanical puppet, but taught the fledgling how to live like a human, and continuously reassured him that, despite his lack of a physical heart, he wasn't all that different from the people of Tatarasuna. He was human, as far as Niwa was concerned, and he belonged with his friends and family. Scaramouche may have been denied his birthright and abandoned by his creator, but maybe that was okay. He had somehow found himself a real family. 
He may not have been Niwa's real son, but Scaramouche followed in his footsteps all the same, studying the Ishin style of bladesmithing, a crafting method that would eventually be passed down through the Kaedahara family line all the way to Kazuha. Those happy days, however, were short-lived, as a mechanic by the name of Escher soon arrived and introduced the blacksmiths to a new method of processing crystal marrow for use in forging. This was a terrible idea. Although it did create incredible swords, crystal marrow grew from the bones of the resentful snake god Orobashi, whose lingering hatred created the toxic phenomenon known as the Tataragami. Smelting the crystal marrow released the Tataragami energy in the form of filth and black smoke that leached out of the Mikage furnace, both of which caused the local populations to grow ill and die. Eventually, the problem spiraled out of control and Niwa enacted a full information blackout in an attempt at keeping the fallout damage to a bare minimum. He petitioned for help from the capital, but help never came. Desperate to save his friends in his newfound home, Scaramouche left for the capital himself, instead hoping that his golden feather could grant him an audience with the Electro Archon. But the one who would recognize that feather was no longer in power. A had long since left Inazuma in the control of the Shogun puppet, who refused to see him as his needs were not part of her programming. The message he wished to send to A never reached her. Yae Miko met with him instead, and despite his lack of faith in her promises, she did send aid to the people of Tatarasuna. But that aid was intercepted by Escher, who claimed that there was no disaster at the forge at all. And the only problem they were facing was the fact that the one in charge of the forge, Niwa, had abandoned the project and fled the islands. But this was a lie. Niwa had confronted Escher, only to discover that Escher was actually the Fatui harbinger, Dottore. Dottori had set up the entire situation at the forge at the orders of Piero, who apparently had just wanted to cause a little bit of chaos for Inazuma. But Dottori had grown curious about the god-crafted puppet that was Scaramouche, and thought of him as a very interesting new test subject he wanted to play with. As part of this impromptu experiment, Dottori killed Niwa, carved out his heart, and placed it into a purification device. He then gave it to the newly returned Scaramouche with the instruction to use the device to shut down the Vernus and save the people of Tatarasuna. He took the device and went to the furnace determined to save the people who gave him a home, fully expecting to die in the process. But the heart within the purification device, Niwa's heart, protected him. When he asked Dottori about it afterwards, Dottori lied, claiming the device had the heart of a servant that Niwa had killed before fleeing to Tarasuna with his family. Scaramouche was devastated. He had been abandoned once again, and this time by someone he truly cared about, and someone who he thought truly cared about him. But according to Dottori, it was all a lie. Niwa had lied to him. He never considered Scaramouche's family. Scaramouche never belonged with the people of Tatarasuna. He tore out the heart from within the device and left the forge for good. He wandered alone for an unknown period of time, nursing fresh wounds from Niwa's betrayal. And at his lowest point, he met a sick orphan child. Scaramouche thought them to be alike, both fledglings, barely out of the nest, with no family and no place to belong. They pledged instead to become each other's family and that they'd be together forever. Slowly but surely, Scaramouche began to pick up the shattered pieces of his life and put them back together. But one day, he came home to find the boy dead. Scaramouche was already emotionally vulnerable from the events of Tatarasuna, and this death nearly broke him. Humans don't keep their promises. They cannot be trusted. But the god who made him cannot be trusted either. She had cast him aside like worthless dross, denied him his birthright, his heart in the shape of a gnosis, and refused to aid the people he loved when he begged her to. He wasn't a human. He wasn't a god. He was just a lonely puppet with no one to turn to, nowhere to go, and no reason to exist. He thought perhaps it would have been better had he never been born at all. The house he lived in with the deceased child caught fire, and Scaramouche almost let himself burn along with it, but he didn't. Instead, he left Yashiori Island for Rito, where he was recruited upon a Fatui ship by Piero himself. 
maybe by joining an organization like the Fatui, Skarmush could finally feel like he was worth something. It was under Piero's leadership that he would gain three new names, Skaramouche, the Balladeer, and Kuni Kazushi, the Nation Destroyer. His early years as a Fatui Harbinger had him suffering countless brutal experiments at the hands of Dottore, only managing to survive because of his exceptional resilience as a divine puppet. The knowledge acquired from these experiments allowed Dottore to create his iconic segments. Scaramouche wouldn't see Dottore much over the next 300 years as Piero reassigned him to special recon missions that mostly took place within the Abyss. But when those missions began to dwindle, he found himself wandering back to Inazuma. Hatred and resentment towards the man who betrayed him all those years ago bubbled to the surface. Niwa may have been dead, but he had been a practitioner of the Ishin Arts, one of the swordsmithing schools of the Raiden Gokuden, which made them a perfect target for Skaramouche's pent-up revenge. He can't really take revenge on a dead man, after all. This led him to destroy three of the five schools of the Raiden Gokuden, but when it came time to destroy the Ishin school, Niwa's school, he hesitated. It's possible that meeting Kaedahara Yoshinori stirred some long-buried feelings within the Heartless Puppet. Memories of a happier time. Precious memories. His only precious memories began to surface. Even if he had been betrayed by Niwa, Niwa had been his family once upon a time. Someone he cared deeply about. And destroying all that was left of him may have left him feeling a bit hollow. A may have been right about his emotions making him weak and unstable after all. So he let Yoshinori live with only a warning, and abandoned his revenge. Around 100 years after the Raiden Gokuden disaster, Skarmouche was reassigned to investigate the falling meteors in Liwe and Mondstadt. This led him to learn about the false sky and allowed him to meet the Traveler who, at the time, was nothing more than an eyesore that needed to be eliminated. Scaramouche would attempt to take the Traveler's life, but his investigation on the meteors took priority, and he left without finishing the job. He was quickly reassigned and instructed to take over the Delusion Factory in Inazuma from Senora, where he met the Traveler once again. This time, he fully intended to take the Traveler's life. But Yai Miko had been following the Traveler and offered Scaramouche a deal. The Gnosis in exchange for the Traveler's life. Miko knew exactly what that Gnosis meant to the puppet. Up until that point, his life had been nothing but a mess of pain, loss, betrayal, and abandonment, and here she was, offering him something he had always been denied. His birthright, his original reason for existing, his heart. Finally, he could prove he was worth something, that his creator was wrong for abandoning him, and that humans were wrong for betraying him. Suddenly, he had a new goal that superseded any goal that came before. He took the Gnosis and sought help from Dottore. The man may have effectively tortured him for years without remorse with countless heartless experiments, but if anyone could turn Skarmouche into a god, it would be the doctor. If he needed to become the test subject of another brutal experiment, then so be it. He allowed the doctor and the sages to modify and mutilate his body in order to connect it to its new robotic shell. He waited patiently beneath Sumeru City as the townsfolk were subjected to 168 samsaras and the mad scholars had their divine knowledge downloaded into 168 knowledge capsules. Soon, he would become a god. Soon, he would have worth. But the cost of his godhood was far too steep of a price for the Dendro Archon. She refused to let her people be exploited in such a way. She escaped her confinement with the help of the Traveler and trapped Scaramouche in a samsara of his own making, finally seizing the Electronosis and crushing his dreams underfoot. This defeat destroyed what was left of his spirit. He no longer had any reason or any will to exist. So Nahida gave him a reason. She offered him a deal. She'd release him and let him stay in Sumeru if he agreed to work for her. Even with his spirit completely crushed, Skaramouche had this incredible desire to be wanted and needed, so he did not hesitate to take that deal. If nothing else, it was a reason to live. His first assignment was to venture into Ermansol in search of information for the Traveler, but Nahida had slightly different plans. 
While she did want him to find information on the Descenders, she also thought it was very important that he learned the truth of what happened in Tatarasuna all those years ago. So she subtly showed him a memory that she took from Dottore. And upon seeing it, Scaramouche was filled with rage and regret. For the truth was, Niwa had never lied to him. Niwa had never abandoned him. Everything that happened back then happened because of Dottore. Dottore was the one who lied to him. Dottore was the one who betrayed him. Dottore was the one who was to blame for all of the needless deaths of the people of Tatarasuna, for the endless suffering and experiments and pain that Skarmush had been put through for 500 years. And once he had composed himself and completed his assignment as agreed, he pulled the traveler aside and asked them a simple question. Was it possible to change the past? The traveler's reaction was enough for him to gamble on the possibility that the past indeed could be changed. So he gathered what little power he had left and connected to Erminsel. If he could give the people of Tatarasuna another chance at life, then he would gladly erase himself from the world. And in doing so, maybe he could make things right. But changing the past isn't so simple. The truth is, the past cannot be changed. Not by Scaramouche, not by Nahida, not by anyone. What's happened has happened, what's done is done, what's broken is broken, and the only thing that can change is the way that the past is remembered by those in the present. That much, at least, is within Erminsel's capabilities. So instead of making things right, the world just forgot about him. Legends and records were adjusted to make up for inconsistencies in the narrative, but his existence had left a permanent mark on the world, regardless of whether or not anyone remembered it. He had still existed. A had still created him. He had still woken up in the Shake Pavilion. He had still spent time with the people of Tatarasuna, and Niwa had still taken him in, but human minds are so fickle and their memories can so easily be altered no one would ever realize the truth, not even Scaramouche who had even forgotten his own past. As far as he was concerned, he was merely a wandering Shugenja monk, still a puppet, still alone, still aimless, but still in existence. But as a descender, the Traveler is immune to Erminsel's tinkering, and they quickly recognize Scaramouche wandering around Sumeru City. Now, they could have just let him be, it's not as though he'd cause any more trouble in his current state, but they instead offered him a chance to recover his memories. And Skarmush could have easily refused this, walked away, and that would have been that, one less harbinger to deal with. But Skarmush had one desire in life, to be worth something, to be wanted, to be needed, and to just have a purpose. So even when Nahida and the Traveler told him about how his past self was a horrible person that committed countless atrocities and how many considered him to be evil, Skarmouche was not deterred. He wanted to know the truth because somewhere in that truth lay the meaning to his very existence. So he asked Nahida for his memories. People of all types have a difficult time facing themselves, especially when they know that they've made mistakes, when they know that they've hurt people, and when they just don't like themselves. And the less support they have from the people around them, the harder it is to look themselves in the eye and just accept what they see. It's even harder to take it a step further and actively take responsibility for the person you used to be, because growing up and becoming a better person is painful. But that's part of what makes us human. And that's why this moment was so powerful. Skarmush faced the person he was when he was at his worst. He looked himself in the eye and said, You were me. You are me. I exist because you exist. And together we're going to do better. Because we deserve better. And this acceptance gets him an animo vision. In the end, Skarmouche wasn't redeemed. He wasn't even forgiven. But he was allowed to take responsibility for all the things he had done. And in fact, he wanted to take responsibility for them. 
That's why he asked the Traveler to tell the remaining riding Gokadan heirs of what he did in spite of the fact that there are no records or evidence of his involvement at all. It would have been so easy to just forget the whole thing, to pretend it never happened, but he does not make that choice. He decides to do the right thing and be better. And in the end, Scaramouche's story is a very powerful lesson in learning to trust, accepting responsibility for your mistakes, and discovering your own self-worth. And I think that whether you love him or hate him as a character, this lesson is one we should take to heart. It is so important not to deny where you came from and who you used to be, because everything you used to be is part of what makes you who you are today. I mean, Scaramouche isn't suddenly goody-goody after all, you know? He may still be trying to do the right thing, but he is still swearing vengeance against Dottore for wronging him, which shows that he didn't learn much about the nature of revenge, and I'm sure he's going to make a lot of questionable choices in the future as he carries out missions as Nahida's shadow operative, but I think that's okay. Because this time around, Scaramouche has people who believe in him, who will support him and guide him, and who are wholly deserving of his respect, trust, and loyalty. And he is damn proud of it, too. This wasn't exactly the video I set out to make, but thank you all so much for watching. I sincerely hope that the new year brings you at least a little bit closer to the person you want to become. And no matter who you are, just know that you deserve to be happy, too. So this year, treat yourself right. Take care, everybody, and Happy New Year's. Here's to the best 2023 we can possibly have.